Okay, so when you're ready, you can open your eyes, come back into the Zoom. Yeah, it was intense. <laughs> um, yes. There was not much happening. Uh, mostly. It felt like I, I just need to step aside to let this energy flow just go through me which entered like in this area here and it was just a feeling of intenseness and i just my only job was to to do nothing <laughs> with it <laughs> to just allow it yeah right right that's a pretty tough job <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you carry on looking like a monk and having your beard grow longer and longer, they'll be they'll be they'll be tapping on your door and they'll think you're the guru here. Mm. I think I look a bit too ordinary. I'm joking, of course. Yeah. Okay, very nice. Perhaps somebody else would like to volunteer. I don't think I've met Miriam before. Would you like to share something, Miriam? <laughs> Hallo. Hello. Ja, es ging schon sehr tief und ich habe auch immer ge geschaut, also dass ich da nicht auf irgendwas oder ja auf irgendwas eingehe. Aber ich habe ein Phänomen gerade und das ist ganz komisch. Das glaubt fast auch keiner. Aber ich habe hier. So it was very, uh, ich übersetze mal eben, ne? So it yeah. was very deep. And um, yeah, but there is a phenomena which uh, I have at the moment, which nobody is believing. Maybe you tell yeah, us. Ja, du kannst weiterreden. Phenomena. Ja, ja. magst du darüber erzählen, über das Phänomen? Es ist merkwürdig, das geht mir schon eine längere Zeit so, in der Nacht oder überhaupt, wenn ich hier bin, den Räumlichkeiten, plötzlich bewegt sich was über mich drüber. Ja, wie so ein Wesen. Wesen. Weißt du, und das hatte ich gerade die ganze Zeit. Ich so, es hat mich immer so ein bisschen dann wieder rausgeholt, weil ich so diese Tapsers so gemerkt habe auf meinem Körper. Da dachte ich, ja, komisch, ich will die weg haben. Also, und gleichzeitig. Soll ich da nicht drauf eingehen? Das ist schon ein bisschen ein komisches Gefühl. Ja. Since a longer time when I'm staying, uh, my eyes closed or when I'm in bed, I have feeling there's something going over me. Yeah, it's like feeling sort of steps going over me. And this was also like this in the meditation and I don't want to engage in it, but it's a bit difficult and a bit strange not to engage in this feeling. So do I understand clearly that she's saying that she gets a feeling somebody is stepping on her? Is there so das Gefühl, als ob einer auf ihr drauf tritt oder so Schritte oder? Ja, das ist wie so eine Wesenheit oder so, weißt du, so wie so eine Art, weißt du, wegen körperlosem Mensch oder mm -hmm. was immer. Es habe ich öfters schon hier erlebt, aber gerade die letzten paar Tage, da waren zwei, drei Leute hier. Vielleicht haben die das reingetragen, ich weiß es nicht, also ganz komisch. Ich habe schon geräuchert oder was, aber das habe ich gerade wieder gespürt. So dachte erst, es ist vielleicht yes, ein Ja, it's, yeah, it's a feeling as if sort of a, a sort of a being, yeah, but, a, but a, a being without a body taps sort of over me, yeah. And um, it was some time ago, and now it happened again. There were some people here recently. Maybe they brought it in. Um, yeah. First, I thought it was maybe my dog. <laughs> well, it's interesting you say that because I don't, I mean, I've never really heard this before. 
But I mean, I don't think anybody's brought it in, you know, and left it sort of left something there. And so I was actually thinking it might be your dog, actually, because you have a nice dog, I think. I was looking, he was quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Ja, ich glaube nicht, dass das jemand hereingebracht hat. Ja. Yeah. We're gonna see you soon in Spain, I think. Yes. Wir sehen dich ja bald in Spanien, ne? Mm -hmm. Good. That would be nice. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe there'll be different steps in Spain. There'll be sort of Spanish steps instead of German steps. In Spanien gibt es vielleicht andere Schritte, die du spürst. Spanische Schritte. Anstelle von deutschen Schritten. Aber ich bin in Spanien. Uh, I'm now in Spain. Oh, you are in Spain. Ah, oh, okay. You live in Spain, do you? Yes. Lebst in Spanien? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't understand you live in Spain. Very good. Yeah. But do you speak Spanish then? Yes, I speak Spanish. Spanish. Better English. Uh, yeah. So. Right, right. We speak the best. <laughs> But you're, you're by birth, you're Spanish or German? I'm German. Bist du denn Spanish? Ah, you're German living in Spain and you speak Spanish and English. That's very good. You'll be very popular in the retreat, I think, speaking Spanish. Mm -hmm. Also wenn du Spanisch <laughs> und Englisch und Deutsch sprechen kannst, da wirst du im Retreat sehr beliebt sein. Ah, oh, okay. I think we have... <laughs> Three other three Spanish people coming, and uh, we have a translator coming. But uh, uh, anyway, you can practice your Spanish. Okay, where do you live in Spain? Near, near Denia? Yes, where do you live in Spain? In La Manga, La Manga del Mar Menor. Um, das ist circa so ja. Stunden entfernt von Denia. Wie viele Stunden? Wie viele Stunden? Zwei. Uh, it's about two hours from India. Oh, okay, good. Okay, almost local. Yeah. <laughs> okay, very nice. We look forward to seeing you soon. Me too. Yeah, <laughs> freuen wir uns, dich bald zu sehen. And you're bringing your dog, I think, yeah? Yes. <laughs> I'm thinking about bringing Und der my... Hund kommt auch mit. Thinking about bringing my daughter, so your dogs would be lucky if they come because they can walk them every day. <laughs> Or the dog yeah, I will. I hope I my daughter with him. There had the hund perhaps luck that they every day can walk. Come on, no, not me. Okay, I think we have to go to our new blonde resident now. Is it blonde? Go to our new blonde. Mitbewohnerin yeah. hier. You want to move your, you want to turn your head left and right? Wow. Wow. <laughs> Very good. <clears throat> Maybe we need, yeah. we need to In, give you a new name now. We can call you Blondie. Oh, thanks not. <laughs> In the hairdresser, hairdresser language, you would say, I was kissed from the sun. Ah, very good, yeah. Okay, so how did the meditation go? So in the beginning, I felt kind of strong heart beating. It was not fast, it was kind of strong. And yeah, then I felt also kind of a lot of space in my body. And... And it was quite surprisingly quiet because I didn't had quiet days, but it was very quiet actually. And here in this yurt, you can hear all the sounds very good. Like you hear from trees falling down some stuff or the wind. It's, it's pretty calming also, yeah. Yeah, good, okay. So, um... Okay, so I'm going to introduce tonight's topic. So tonight we're moving on. Ah, there may be some new new people. I just explained. I'm working through this book. Oh, here it is. Uh, it's Pointless Joy of Freedom. I think maybe most of you 
know that we're talking about this particular book. Um, and we've got as far as chapter five, which of course is the throat, throat chakra. If you remember last week, we we're in on the heart chakra, which is in, in the middle of the main energy centers. There's three below and three above. So now the energy is beginning to move out and we come to this energy center, which is uh, <clears throat> creativity and communication. And, uh, and also we're talking about it in the context of surrender. If we want to live in a way of surrender, then we need to understand that we have the ego, our personal movie running on and on. And we have something else, which we can call the essence. If we want to live in a deep surrender, then we want to surrender to the essence, not to the ego. <clears throat> At a certain point on the spiritual path, we come to see that our mind can't take us any further. And we learn that true surrender means, sorry, and then we learn what true surrender means. We learn to tap no, in. No, no, it's good. It's good. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, I, I forgot about the translation. Do, do I need to pause? No endurance in the background. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, we learn to tap in and nourish our creative impulses <coughs> to come into our hearts and live from a deep trust of life instead of from the thinking and planning of our conditioned minds. We, we come out of the habitual safety net of our ego and fall into something much deeper, a flow of life that happens despite us, not because of us. Hmm. And the first chapter we're going to look at is the one uh, entitled Creativity. And there's a quote there from Osho. And that is the essence of wisdom, to be in harmony with nature, with the natural rhythm of the universe. And whenever you are in harmony with the natural rhythm of the universe, you are a poet, you are a painter, you are a musician, you are a dancer. <clears throat> so I spent many years actually with Osho and uh, in fact I don't often particularly uh, talk about Osho but today we have a visitor Monica and uh, she spent many years um, with Osho and so we had quite a long talk about Osho swapping a few things about Osho and we could both agree that the biggest value we both gained from Osho was um, learning to meditate and doing lots of different styles of meditation. And then also how he often talked about self-awareness. So this meditation we're doing always at the beginning of these meetings is exactly these two aspects. So it's meditation and it's to be self-aware. So though I don't consciously kind of credit Osho, I mean, the influence inside myself is certainly coming from Osho. So as, as some of you know, he was a bit controversial. I think in those days, the German news magazines used to enjoy making, you know, a weekly scandal about Osho. And um, so he became famous in Germany, but maybe not for the right reasons. And the, the, the best English newspaper also sent a reporter, and he was probably also instructed to find some kind of scandals. But in fact, this rather well-known uh, 
news reporter from England was very impressed with what he found, and he wrote three articles very positive about those shirts. So it's kind of interesting. I don't suppose that would have helped the news newspapers to sell more, but uh, but anyway. So um, he he enjoyed actually. I could say he would enjoy provoking those kind of newspaper people. So probably when he would know that there's somebody in the audience, he would be particularly naughty. And he did this particularly strongly in America when he lived in Oregon. He was in silence for several years. I don't remember, maybe three years. He was completely in silence and didn't make any public talks. And then he decided to come out of silence. So he invited the world press to come. And uh, we were living, I was there at the time, and we, we were living on, the, on a ranch in the middle of nowhere in, in, in uh, Oregon. And every night, one of these journalists would arrive from Singapore, Australia, England, wherever they came from. And um, it was it was very interesting how Osha was very clever because he he invited to um, witness this interview because they would interview him. Uh, he would invite close closer people, uh, but other people like John David, we were invited to make a, a lineup outside the interview and Osho would arrive in his car which was always a beautiful uh, Rolls Royce and um, then he would come out of the car and he as he walked down between these two lines uh, of people he would start to kind of stop in front of people and start dancing with them maybe not your idea of dancing Dancing, but it was a kind of dancing <laughs> and this was amazingly scary this was amazingly scary so as he approached down the line got closer and closer to me I could feel how my whole system was kind of cramping up and finally he didn't stop luckily but as he passed by I was like good but it was anyway very uh, a very nice way to meet him, you see, because we didn't have usually much contact to Osho. He was uh, living very much alone and very much separately. So it was almost impossible to have any kind of personal meeting, but that was a, his way of offering a personal meeting. And he had various other tricks to offer personal meetings. Another was after this period of being in silence, well, during this period of being in silence, he got used to driving a Rolls Royce himself, and he would drive out of where we were all living together, and he'd drive out onto the public roads. And this was uh, very exciting for the local people. And so almost every day there was some kind of scandal in the newspaper that, you know, he'd driven the car off the road, or this had happened, or that had happened, and so on. They used to call him the Bagwan. And, uh, but anyway, after some time, he would drive slowly through the place where we're all living together. And we would all line up down the side of the road and he would drive very, very slowly. And uh, in the beginning, we just would stand there and do namaste to him. But as I say, he's a very, he was very clever at creating things. And so uh, after some time, people started to offer roads and sometimes his the bonnet of his car would get so filled up with roses, he'd have to stop and they had to take the roses off the car so other people could put roses. So this was a very nice little moment because sometimes he would wind his window down and um, you gave your rose and it kind of felt very close, very close. And then, of course, sannyasins being who they were, People got the idea that, you know, if they would play music, he almost certainly would stop. So then maybe two or three guys would start playing music and then he would stop and he'd wind his window down and he might start sort of dancing with the music. And of course, it wasn't long before there are many, many groups of musicians, you know, all along the line. There were now people playing music, so he couldn't stop everyone. He would stop at some of them. And... Uh, 
and then um, it developed because later when they were had they had a number of big celebrations when maybe up to about 10,000 people came from all around the world so it was a huge mass of people and the line therefore was very very long and so uh, there was this kind of security risk because by driving out onto the public roads, he created a kind of uh, some sort of dangers for himself because uh, the, the, some of the locals were threatening to shoot him. So uh, then they had a car in front and a car behind as this kind of security people. And then the, the next step, or maybe it was about the final step, I think, um, they would have guns in these cars. And that was always a bit kind of felt a bit strange. And then finally, when they had these big celebrations, they'd also have a helicopter that would drive over the top. So the whole kind of phenomena of this kind of uh, celebration, it became a kind of daily celebration. Um, and it was pretty, pretty, uh, how can I say, I was pretty moved actually sometimes by this whole phenomena that was going on. So this was, uh, there was tremendous love actually towards Osho from the people who were involved with him and the people who weren't involved with him, there was, uh, he kind of easily provoked them, he easily provoked them. And probably many of you will know that he provoked the American government also. Uh, he would talk about, I think it was the days of Ronald Reagan and he would say all kinds of nasty things about Ronald Reagan. And um, finally, one day, it was decided that the whole security aspect got too dangerous. Uh, the, the local state was sending planes over the, um, well, it was a city, actually. By then, it was called Rajneesh Puram. It was a city, officially um, incorporated city. And the state would send these low-flying airplanes over the city. So the whole thing was getting very tense. So they decided it's better that OSHA flies away. And this city we had, um, they had their own airport and they had several planes. So um, he got into a plane and he was flown out suddenly one day. And you may have heard the story. He flew over the States for some hours and then they needed to um, refuel the plane and they landed I think it was in Charlottesville, but I may, maybe not. And when he got out of the plane, they arrested him, along with the people traveling in the plane. And then there were these magnificent television uh, evenings where they showed Osho wearing prison clothes, hand, uh, handcuffed, without his hat, so he was kind of bald-headed. And um, they were also incredible moments because... This man, I mean, even though he might be in prison clothes and handcuffed, you could still feel some kind of, I don't know the right word really, but very particular, um, it, it, it touched me a lot, let's just say, it touched me a lot. Yeah. So this was, a, he, he managed to kind of get on national television and he was in, even interviewed by one or two of the famous TV anchors. They would... Uh, they would interview him when he was in prison and so on. So, I mean, he he's, he always managed to create a kind of uh, promotion, you know, for his ideas, even when it wasn't apparently a very uh, good situation for him. Anyway, so I have many, I'm, I could carry on all night talking about Osho because I have so many stories. But anyway, um, he, he's, he was really somebody who talked quite a lot about creativity. And um, I remember one time I asked him actually a question about creativity. It's my, I think, only question he ever answered. And he, his answer very simply was that there are three creativities. One is to uh, create a child. And the higher creativity is to create a picture or sing a song or such things. And the third creativity is to create yourself into a Buddha. 
So I hope everybody on the screen tonight is planning on the third one. And this is actually very, very beautiful. The idea that we can create ourselves into a Buddha. And maybe this is a little bit, uh, you know, this is not in some people's idea, but uh, this is the potential. This is actually the potential of every human being. Of course, now, after 2000 years, Buddha has become a very kind of uh, spiritual superstar or something like this. And so it makes it feel like it's impossible that you could ever be like Buddha, you see. In fact, when I first came to Osho, in one of my moments of excitement, I wrote to my parents that, you know, now I'm heading towards Jesus and Buddha and uh, Lao Tzu, blah, blah, blah. And they weren't very impressed with that, of course. So I learned not to say such stupid things. Well, stupid or not. Yeah. Anyway, so that's enough about Osho. Um, <clears throat> all right, yeah. So, so one of the things that um, has always been clear to me that, you know, when you try to paint a picture or to make a sculpture, I mean, if you're there and you have some idea, I'm going to paint, you know, a house with a dragon on the roof or something, then it comes very much from the ego. It comes very much from the mind. It's some kind of idea, your idea. You know? But there's another way of painting or another way of uh, dancing where you are not really there. You can say there's an absent painting. And I have this example of uh, Michelangelo. So Michelangelo um, was learning the trade of cutting stone, being a stonemason, when he was already a young man, maybe a teenager, maybe, I don't know, 12 years old. So this was in the tradition of Florence, where he was living. And <coughs> later, when he was at still, I think, 20 or 22, something like that, still very young, he uh, took a large block of marble, a huge block of marble, and he carved this Pieta, the mother and the child. He, he um, created this Pieta out of this huge block of white marble. And... Um, if you see this, it's in the, one of the side chapels in the, in the Vatican. And I, I saw it years ago now. And all I can remember is, is being touched, you know, that when you, when you stand in front of great art, like that sculpture certainly is, there's some kind of transmission happens. It's not so much that, you know, you're looking at the way he carved the baby. Oh, here, here we are, you see? This is the sculpture. So I, when I was there, I wasn't particularly looking at uh, Jesus or the mother or anything like that. But I, I th th there was a, there was an aura. There was a, a strong energy, and I was immediately affected by the energy of the sculpture. Very very beautiful, and I've had that experience quite a few times in my life. I remember I was also in the Louvre in uh, Paris, and I was walking along. They have a grand chamber, a grand, um, whatever it is, gallery, a big gallery, a long gallery, about half a kilometer long. And they have so many great paintings that they're usually one on top of the other in this gallery. And I was just walking along, looking at the paintings. I mean, there's so much to look at, really. And then there was one particular painting where I had to stop. I stopped and looked at this painting, and I thought, wow. And again, there was this feeling of, of something happening inside me, like a transmission. And then I went to look, who, who is the painter? And guess what? It was Leonardo da Vinci. So these great artists, they are able tra to transmit um, something very deep and very incredible, actually. And if you're receptive enough, you can get this transmission. So this is, this is art from the essence, art from the being, not from the ego, not from the mind. 
And this is a fairly rare phenomenon. But in our community here, we have, um, as you know, an art gallery. And in, the, in our satsang room, we've collected also on two levels because we have so many paintings. Over the last 15 or 20 years, we've collected uh, a, a painting from almost all the exhibitions. And as some of you know, we've only been exhibiting artists who paint from their being and not from their mind. Of course, they use their mind, but they're not painting out of their egoistic idea, something like that. It's, it's almost, you can see, creativity can come from an absence of somebody. It's uh, maybe a bit strange, but uh, yeah. So then we've got a, a quote from uh, uh, Nizha Gadatta Maharaj. Um, if you remember his story, he was uh, living in Bombay in the red light district, and he had a shop selling Indian cigarettes they called Beedies. And my friend Osho used to call him Beedy Baba, and uh, that prevented me ever going to see Maharaj. That's the only, well, that's the worst thing I have against Osho, I think. Anyway, this quote is <clears throat> about destiny. All that happens, happens in and to the mind, not to the source of the I am. Once you realize that all happens by itself, call it destiny or the will of God or mere accident, you remain as witness only, understanding and enjoying, but not perturbed. You see? So this is, this is what we're doing every night at the beginning of our Zoom meetings. We're just watching what is happening. And this is the, probably the most valuable uh, thing you can do every day. You just watch what's happening without any judgment about it, without any attempt to change it. You just accept it. And, and if you do this over a longer period, then you find that your meditation goes deeper and deeper and <clears throat> it changes day by day it changes by itself changes by itself most people have the idea i am doing my life the whole education system all of society is based on this idea i must say when i Recently, I've been going out to meet uh, doctors because I need some doctoring soon. Um, when I go out to meet doctors, uh, then I meet their secretaries and then I meet maybe a couple of the patients or maybe I don't talk to them, but I can just see them, feel them. <clears throat> you can just sense that these people are completely living in a kind of I am doing my life. And this is very, very superficial very superficial. So what, of course, we're trying to do in the Open Sky House is to come much deeper inside. In fact, today I was talking to Monica. She's going to write us a, a review because she was telling me today that uh, she finds the Open Sky House, the people being very grounded, very open, very heartful. So she has a very positive um, experience in the couple of days she's <clears throat> two or three days she's been here and of course uh, when we live all together day by day by day we don't realize how nice the water is in our goldfish bowl you see so I thought it was very sweet that she was giving so many compliments and she's going to write something and then I'll send it around to everybody Here, here is something I often say at the beginning of retreats. We are where we're supposed to be, and what is supposed to happen is happening. There is nothing to be concerned about, nothing to be afraid of. <clears throat> and then to finish, we have a, a, a quote from Neem Karoli Baba. By the way, these three masters I'm talking about, within this book, 
if you get a copy of this book, um, I have a, a page, a bio page for each of these masters. You can find it in the book. The real contentment comes only through the grace of God. When you have full faith in him, full reliance on him, when you can surrender everything to him, then that grace comes to you by itself. You do not have to ask for it or make any effort. So this is a, a very beautiful quotation, actually. And uh, most of you know Neem Karoli Baba. He, he was a kind of... Uh, superstar guru you could say superstar guru and most of you maybe know the story that um, an american called ram das he came to india uh, looking for a guru and he didn't find any guru he'd been traveling around india but he didn't find anybody that touched him so he went to Kathmandu, and he was waiting in a five-star hotel to fly back to the states and then there's this story that this hippie guy came into the coffee shop, with long, long, long hair and long beard. <clears throat> they started talking. And after some days, I think it was some days, uh, they both went back into India and they walked, walked together through India. And they ended up by meeting Neem Karoli Baba. And the night before they got to Neem Karoli Baba, Ram Das had been uh, leaving his room in the evening, going out into the night and remembering the death of his mother. She had died from some problem with her spleen. And then the next day when they came to Neem Karoli Baba, um, he was sitting, I think, on a hill, on the, on the grass of a hill. And uh, Ram Das arrived in a jeep that he borrowed from a friend. And the first thing that Neem Karoli Baba said to him was, would you like to give me your jeep? And uh, this was completely shocking for Ram Das, you see, because he had a sort of judgment about Indian gurus that they always want to take your money. So he got a very bad impression and he was, you know, very much judging Neem Karoli Baba. And then Neem Karoli Baba suddenly said to him, uh, you were, you were, um, out in the night and you were connecting to your mother's uh, death by spleen or something something like that yeah so then immediately Ram Das completely changed from his judgments and he became completely touched and some kind of inner surrender happened in that moment so then Neem Karoli Baba became his guru he stayed in India and he came to the small ashram that Neem Karoli Baba had up in the foothills of the Himalayas. And he stayed there for a pretty long time. I don't know if it was as long as a year, but uh, anyway, many months he stayed there. I think it probably was a, a year. And he followed whatever the uh, spiritual practices were, as suggested by Neem Karoli Baba. And he ate very simple ashram food. And he went through a big transformation in those that, that time. And then gradually, um, I think I think after some period, maybe it was a year, he had to go back to the States, maybe because of his visa. And then he told all his friends about this uh, Neem Karoli Baba. And so later there was a group of, I don't know, about 25, 30 people from the States who would sit every day with Neem Karoli Baba. And he would sit on one of these traditional Indian rope beds. And the, the Americans were all very sophisticated people, of course. They would all sit on the ground in front of him. And he would just sit there like a very jolly, happy guy. And he would basically sit there under a blanket. So he, he, he didn't wear normal clothes. He just had a big blanket. And um, he would sit there very happy and he would be looking out on these people. And if you were lucky, he'd throw you a banana. 
if you were unlucky, he wouldn't even look at you the whole time. So he he played with these people, you know, he was constantly playing with them. And he had this enormous ability to know what people were thinking. So if you were thinking, then you wouldn't get a banana. So if you wanted a banana, you had to get quiet pretty quickly. And uh, so his teaching method, if you like, was pretty primitive, but his inner power was enormous. I could tell you other stories, which maybe I've told you before. So he's always been somebody that I felt very attracted to, uh, but uh, here he is under his blanket, you see. And that looks like apples or something he's about to throw at these Americans. Maybe, yeah, I think it looks like an apple. Anyway, so I was very attracted actually, but um, unfortunately I was too late. I never met him, but I had a miracle one day because the when I was in Lucknow, there was a, there was a week where Papaji decided to go traveling and we had, I had nothing to do for a week. And there was an advertisement from somebody <clears throat> who was offering to rent a small house. And I went to see this house and I got talking to somebody. He was sitting there smoking beadies, not looking particularly spiritual. But anyway, he told me that he was going to meet the, dis the close disciples of Neem Karoli Bab. He's going traveling to Neem Karoli's ashram in the he Himalayas, in the foothills of the Himalayas. And after we talked together for a while, um, he said, well, if you want, you can come with me. So I was completely shocked, but I immediately said, yes, I have to come. So it was a very funny week because he didn't really like me very much. I was talking too much. I, in those days, I, I was not very cool. I wasn't very cool. So, But anyway, we went on this trip together. And so I met the closest people to Neem Karoli Baba, which was really amazing. And of course, they all shared their stories of Neem Karoli Baba and so on. So I met his main translator who was the um, headmaster of the local school i i met um very close uh well two or three very close uh, disciples actually who in their own way were also remarkable people remarkable people so he was an enormously powerful um, teacher and guru and you may not know this but there were several of the famous american tech guys who had either met Neem Karoli Baba or had been touched by Neem Karoli Baba. I, I can't remember all their different names, but they're qu all quite famous guys and maybe also including uh, Steve Jobs. It's reputed that when he, when he died, he had a picture of Neem Karoli Baba on his, the wall of his bedroom. You may know, for example, that uh, Steve Jobs used to walk around barefoot. Although he was the boss of this huge company, he he was, uh, uh, yeah, he was a bit of a spiritual kind of. Uh, um, he was probably a bit like Hannah, actually, always wearing jeans and barefoot. Okay, so that's it. That's it. So, anybody like to have a? Talk about what I've been talking about. <clears throat> it's always nice how everybody rushes to talk to me after. So you can just wave your hand if you'd like to have a dialogue. <clears throat> Okay, so we'll we'll go through older wisdom first, and then we'll talk to Blondie. Okay, Pavati. Yeah, I like to ask you. Um, for a very long time, I have always this very quiet 
space. Uh, the mind is quiet, but I have still the feeling there is not something which which needs to come or something. <laughs> what didn't happen yet? What and so my question is: uh, What do you mean? You say that most of the time you're quiet. But you still yeah. have the idea that something else is meant to happen. Yeah, this is in the background here. Something is not missing, or and what what is missing? Do you think? Mm, I think it's um, when you talk about the space, and you always say and fall deeper. And for me, it's not deep. It is always the space. In total, around me, it is there is not that I feel the deepness. I feel more. And do you sometimes, maybe in a meditation, experience something deeper? What you call deeper? I would always say this is more the total space. Also, that I have no body anymore, that is the space. But it's not the feeling like deeper, no? It is more space, more space. You feel um, more space. So, I mean, it's, everything is quiet and you feel more space. But you still yeah, have some, I, I mean, what kind of idea do you have? You want to have something called enlightenment happen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. My, my background there is not an idea um, that something needs I mean, to happen. You, you know, I had some kind of strong moment when I was with Papaji, yeah? and mm. this was very fantastic, and many things happened, blah, blah, blah. Yes, yes. And then some years later, you know, I was still wondering, you know, was that it, or could there be something else? You know? <laughs> and in fact, I, I met. One um, one American teacher, and uh, I remember asking him, you know, I would like to know if I really, you know, if I really got everything, or blah blah. Yeah. blah. <laughs> and somehow, you know, the reality is nobody can answer that question. Actually, only you know. You know it's like an inner knowing. You know? So mm -hmm. I, I I I can't judge from what you're saying, really, except that mm -hmm. what would happen if you dropped your idea? You know, if you. Uh, if yeah. you accept yeah. you as you are now and you don't have any if you drop any concept you have about you know mm. something else you would like to have like for enlightenment maybe if you drop this idea then what is missing mm -hmm. how does that feel not so good. You still want the big bang to happen? Yes. <laughs> the big bang. <laughs> but it's good to talk about it because I always hear, ne? I know this maybe it's not a bang, but uh, maybe to, to talk about it then it must make it more clear. Ne? So if you, some... if you think back to a few years ago yeah, and you think back then and you you are aware of how you feel now do you think something has changed between the that time a few years ago and now is it fundamentally the same you had the same kind of desire back then as you have now no i just i would say it is uh like i always say very ordinary as i have the feeling it's very strong, ordinary, that life is ordinary, and it's also okay that it's ordinary. As it, no? And uh, you'd like something more special, really? No, this is good. This is as well, it's more ordinary. It's just simple and ordinary and fine. But okay. this little, little, no? this little idea, this is still sometimes it is, it is still there, I would say. Mm -hmm. So maybe you you start just to look at that. You know, yeah. Part time, you just look at what this what it is. What is it always the same kind of desire you have, or does it change? Mm. And if you look back over some period of time, has it, you know, was that thought there before two years ago or something? And has it has, has it still the same thought? You know, 
probably mm. you'll start to laugh at some point because um, <laughs> you can't just trust what's happening, you know, because mm. in a way what makes enlightenment special is that it's ordinary. And because it's pretty ordinary, uh, you know, the disciples always have to write fantastic stories, you know. So, um, you know, most most of the um, traditional um, well-known masters, they have great stories about how they got enlightenment, you know, very special stories. And uh, but yeah. I think these stories are made by their disciples because they wanted their just they wanted their master to be special. Yeah, and there's a second the second thought uh, also that uh, the structures doesn't grab you anymore. Sorry, say it again. It's the structure you have in your mind, the mind structures you have. Or you have from your childhood that this doesn't grab you anymore and this is also not the truth as i know okay. but there is a bit of thought that uh, this also will go away with the enlightenment well also you can see if you have anything left which is coming regularly and disturbing you regularly and then you can maybe investigate that a bit mm -hmm. that's not happening that would suggest that, you know, basically that's it, but sometimes maybe it's not it because something has disturbed you and mm -hmm. gradually things that disturb you will stop disturbing you. Mm -hmm. so probably everything is going quite well, I would think. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, we were going to talk to to Carly. Are you there, Carly? Yeah. Hello. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to share about this creativity part. Um, that I noticed this a lot when, for example, I'm singing in the mantra band, and when thoughts start to came up, then um, I play a wrong note or something happens, you know. It's the space when there's no thoughts, when it can really flow. And yes, yeah, so this creativity is always um, something where I notice this when when I'm present. And yeah, it's just, just more creativity can flow and happen. I mean, you have rather a good ability to be creative. And you have rather a good ability to kind of sabotage that. Yes, 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 yes. Very right. strong. Right, right. And this is also the other thing. This surrender to the existence. Mm -hmm. um, I really don't know why this sabotage is so strong in me, but I can, it's like I can really see the moments where it's, it feels like almost I can choose. Do I follow now my old pattern or or not? And often it's the pattern, the structure. So this is, um, I don't know. Well, it changed, of course, already since being in a community. But I feel sometimes frustrated how um, how strong the pattern can grab. And that only noticing it, it's somehow not really changing. I feel like... It feels still like doing. I need to do something, you know, to don't go in this direction of structure. But, you know, my, my observation, and I've told you this several times, is that, you know, when you're being creative, you're, you're really uh, um, very creative. It's surprisingly creative. You've been making these short films, you know, maybe not recently, but... So you're just naturally very creative. It's always a bit surprising how creative you are. And also you've um, been in the, in the mantra band from probably the beginning of your time in the community. And so these things are just, in a way, an easy flow for you. Yeah. Then you're also quite attached to um, some concepts you have about your family, about what an old, how an older sister should be and such things, you know. And also yeah. you have these kind of rather gribbly 
teenage um, experiences, which probably every teenager has, but you never quite let go of those uh, grouply times and they kind of pull you back into certain structures that don't really help you very much. But maybe all that sundown in Spain has, has had a good effect. Yeah. I don't know. Has it? Is it is yeah. It less of going back to this old idea it's, you have? It's a little bit different, yeah. I I feel more uh, maybe more clear it still happens, but I can it's different my observation about it somehow. But it, it's also some days very strong. Uh, yeah. So when did you last take a swim in the pool? Oh, well, this is a quite a few days, well, last week or something. And the water is warm? Are we going to be enjoying warm water? Or... Well, now it's cold. I was always cold swimming, but we will heat it up. So for the retreat, it will be... Oh, you're going to heat it up. Very good, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we're very lucky. Yeah, we have this great oil-based heating system for the pool, <clears throat> which works very well. Actually, works very well. Good. And uh, have you taken a walk down to the Mediterranean recently? Yesterday, yes. Yesterday. Oh. Yesterday, good. after the mantra singing. Yeah. Okay. It was quite quite uh, nice because the mantra singing was very deep i was a really present state i've also my voice is then very different i don't know if the others noticed but i felt like it was like just flowing out of me then i went to the sea and the, you could see the stars and then on the way back i what is the english word there was coming a hedgehog hedgehog i think is the word yeah yeah with spikes um and coming um on the road and then a few moments later a cat so it was kind of these two animals which came to me and then i looked it looked it up and the hedgehog was something like um yeah what was it coming back to intuition and then the cat is um standing for that freedom lays in your I don't know the English word right now, but um, yeah, something about freedom because the cat is always like having a very authentic way or something. I don't know how to describe, but when I read this in this moment, it was like really touching me and reminded me of, yeah, that I need to listen to this, to this wisdom around me. And um, yeah, around you and inside you, because uh, you know you have the ability to connect to all that wisdom. Yeah, and you do do a lot of the time, and then you forget, and then you enjoy some of your grimly old stories. <laughs> okay, very good, very good. So we've got a bit more time. Does anybody else want to share? <clears throat> What about Jaya? Would you like to share something, Jaya, from this evening's uh, topics about surrendering? Oh, Hingabe, ja, das versuche ich. Um, ich versuche nicht nur spezielle, tiefe um, Erfahrungen zu haben, sondern ich versuche jeden im Alltag auch möglichst ja, viel Gewahrsein zu haben in jedem Moment oder ja. So I not only try to have special deep experience, I try to be aware in daily life every moment. Right. Right. Yeah, that's good. It's very good, of course. 
Ja, das ist sehr gut. Ja, ich merke auch, dass sich das stetig ein bisschen vertieft. Ja, yeah, and I can see that this constantly is deepening. Right, right. Yes, and I mean, <clears throat> you've been coming kind of regularly over the last period of time, I think maybe two years, and it seems that there's yeah, some, also something... Seit zwei Jahren kommst du ja regelmäßig und es scheint, als ob sich da was geändert hat. Ja, aber ich mache noch immer viele, viele... Ich praktiziere auch für mich viel. Ich glaube, vor allem ähm, die Meditation ist seit ungefähr zwei Jahren oder so regelmäßiger. Davor habe ich auch meditiert, aber nicht so regelmäßig. Es kam einfach ja, so schleichend immer mehr. Aber ich versuche ja schon seit vielleicht 20 Jahren. Um, so uh, since two years I'm practicing regularly, I'm meditating regularly. Before I also meditated, but not so regularly. I mean, all together I am practicing since 20 years. Right, right. And also in the last time, I don't know if it's the last two years, but things on the outside are also changing, yeah? Because you, yeah, well, many years perhaps of wanting to leave your husband, you did leave him. Im Außen haben sich ja auch viele Dinge verändert in der letzten Zeit. Du hast ja viele ja. Jahre, wolltest du deinen Mann verlassen, aber hast ihn nicht verlassen. Ja. Bis du ihn dann endlich verlassen hast. Ja, ja aber ich habe immer das Gefühl, ich weiß, einerseits denke ich, vielleicht war es falsch, aber ich weiß, dass es gar nichts Falsches gibt, zum einen. Und es ist auch so auf eine Art zu Ende geführt worden, dass es mir ja, es ist egal, ob er da ist oder nicht da ist oder ob ich ihn mal treffe oder nicht. Oder es, es, ja, es berührt mich nicht. Sometimes I think maybe it was wrong, but I know there is, there is nothing which can be wrong. And also in a way it was sort of like a thing which came to the end and uh, it doesn't touch me anymore. Right, right. And are you still friends together? Sometimes you meet, sometimes you can be just friends. Seid ihr denn auch so befreundet miteinander und seht euch ab und zu? Äh, nein. Befreundet kann man nicht sagen. Es kann sein, dass er mir mal noch Post vorbeibringt. I wouldn't say we are friends, but it can happen that he passes by and brings mail. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I want to finish with the uh, to, to tell you something. So recently, in the last two weeks, uh, we've been putting up on uh, YouTube the original blueprint interviews. So also, about... ich wollte sagen, dass wir dass wir auf YouTube. Ah, oben. Du musst mich ausschalten. No, not on, not on YouTube. Yeah. On YouTube, we're putting up the original Blueprints interviews. So, okay, translate that. Uh, she's again in the background translating. Oh, in the background. Ah, oh, okay. So, um, these interviews were done about uh, 12, 15 years ago. I started in India, and then later I... Um, also interviewed Western teachers, and we're beginning to put these up on the um, on the internet, so you can watch the the, the whole usually about ninety minutes. Uh, the whole interview is now up on YouTube, but it's also on this page. So if you see this page, that you come to this page by going to my website, coming to Satsang, and then going down to videos. And on the on the right hand side it says interviews. So if we uh, open up that page of interviews, so here is the Indian masters, and so we're slowly putting up all all those original interviews I made. So this is actually very beautiful because first of all, uh, many of these masters are not alive anymore. So you can see them when also when they were younger. And also um, 
this material that came out in the interview hasn't been published before. In, in, the, in the book, um, Blueprints for Awakening, we selected um, interesting answers from all the masters and put them together. But if, you, if, if there's a particular master that you like particularly, you can now watch the whole interview with, with that master by clicking on the, on the photograph. And as I say, it's also been posted up on YouTube, so you can find them also on YouTube. So I think we, at the moment, we're going to put them all up. But at the moment, we've got about, uh, I think, six Indian masters and uh, maybe four or six, six, I think now, uh, Western masters. So this is an enormous uh, resource, actually. And I, I was surprised when I looked at some of them, how young they were when I did the interviews. My, the original message I got was to go and interview the Indian masters before they passed away. And now they're almost, almost everybody has, has passed away. I think, uh, yeah, almost everybody. This, this lady here, she's still uh, going and this man is still going and Ganeshan is still going, but he's now getting very fragile. And um, all the others have passed away. Oh, maybe this Osho guy probably didn't pass away. What was he called? Samdashi. Samdashi. I don't know what happened to him. I lost contact with him. And I'm not sure. He, he had a small ashram in the Himalayas. So maybe he's still there. Okay, and I think you've all had the recent uh, newsletter, um, and so you all know that in um, in two weeks' time I'll be in Denia. We have about uh, at the moment twenty four people coming, and uh, um, it should be uh, it should be exciting to see what's happened to the to the house and garden because. Since already last year, we are continuing to renovate. We put now solar panels and we've got a brand new gate. So now when you arrive by car, you can click and the gates open automatically. So it's quite a, quite a nice, um, it's, it's making the place a lot more uh, usable actually. And we also have an, a new bathroom in the, the living room bathroom is now uh, ex as exciting as the one we had on the uh, Hockney Room on the other side. So there are many changes and uh, everything is very good there now. So, okay. So I see some of you in two weeks and I'll see the rest of you or all of you next week on Thursday. <laughs>